Welcome back, everybody. Today we're going to discuss daily torpor and hibernation and the similarities and differences between the two. During our goldfish lab, you guys learned about ectotherms and what happens to them if the temperature around them changes. We're now going to take a look at what happened to our goldfish when we placed its fish bowl into a container of ice. We're also going to imagine what would have happened to an endotherm, such as a mouse, if we had recreated the same experiment. To measure the temperature of the goldfish's body, we put a thermometer into its water. But because the mouse doesn't have water around it, we're going to imagine that we could put a thermometer into the mouse's mouth. The temperature started off at about 20 degrees Celsius, or roughly 75 degrees Fahrenheit, at room temperature. Over time, it decreased and finally leveled out at about 3 degrees Celsius, just above freezing. The fish's temperature mirrored the environment almost exactly. The colder the environment got, the colder the fish got. However, if we were to replicate the same experience with a mouse, one thing that we would notice is that the mouse, first of all, has a higher starting temperature, and that it would also not decrease that much, even though the environment got a lot colder. The body of the mouse would work much harder in order to maintain the optimal temperature. If we were to extend this graph for a little bit longer, we would notice that the temperature of the fish would continue to stay the same as the environment, and the fish would still be fine. The mouse, however, even though it experiences a very gradual decline in its core temperature, would also continue to drop. If the mouse gets too cold, it may begin to experience hypothermia. If the mouse continues to get cold for a long period of time, it may die. Remember that enzymes cannot function outside of a certain temperature or acidity window. Now let's look at this another way. We're going to compare and contrast endotherms and ectotherms in terms of how much energy output they can produce at different temperatures. For the purposes of this exercise, we're going to look at sustained energy output, so high levels of activity over a longer period of time. An ectotherm can do low levels of activity even at very cold temperatures, so down here. Its peak level of activity happens at right around room temperature, so about 20 to 25 degrees. Above room temperature, however, ectotherms experience a dramatic drop in productivity. When it gets too hot, they simply can't perform anymore. Endotherms function very differently. While they can't perform at all at low temperatures, so below about 30 degrees Celsius, they do extremely well in terms of their output of energy at a range of about 30 to 42 degrees Celsius. However, outside those ranges, most endotherms will not survive. Because they can only exist in this very small range of temperatures efficiently, endotherms have a series of strategies to help them stay inside that window. One of the most common is to have protective covering of some kind. This might be fur, feathers, hair, or a coat. Protective covering helps the organism to retain its body heat rather than losing it to the external environment. Another strategy is shivering. When you shiver, your muscles contract, and the respiration happening in your cells produces heat as a byproduct, which will ultimately raise your core temperature. However, in severe hypothermia, the victim will actually cease shivering. This is because, eventually, your body will deplete all of its stores of glucose, your cells can no longer respirate, and you can no longer generate the ATP necessary to shiver. This is why one of the best ways to treat hypothermia, aside from making sure the person gets warmer, is to make sure that you feed them. With the addition of good food, warm liquids, and warm clothing, most people will recover from hypothermia. One final strategy that some endotherms will use is something called daily torpor. This allows them to use minimal amounts of glucose and still maintain a decent body temperature for long periods of time. One of the most well-known organisms that does daily torpor is the hummingbird. Hummingbirds usually live in very warm areas, but also migrate to New England in order to breed. Unfortunately, they happen to have a very small body size, a lot of surface area for their volume, and they also don't have insulating feathers. So they need to adopt a new strategy in order to make sure that they don't freeze at night when it gets cold. Torpor is a state that uses about 95% less energy than normal. The hummingbird achieves this by hovering its body temperature just above the threshold for hypothermia. As you can see with this graph, instead of going into hypothermia and eventually dying, the hummingbird hovers just above the set point for hypothermia. Even if the temperature gets still colder, the bird's body will automatically self-regulate to maintain this set point or ideal temperature just above the hypothermia point. There are three major characteristics of torpor. Decreased body temp, decreased heart rate and breathing rate, and finally, decreased activity, to the point where the animal may appear to be dead. 
Hummingbirds are almost unique in that they do this every day, which is why we call it daily torpor. Most animals undergo torpor for a long period of time, which we call hibernation. Going into a state of prolonged torpor or hibernation allows animals to stick to very strict metabolic budgets. Because they may not be able to eat all winter, they're going to need to make sure they decrease the amount of energy that they use on a daily basis in order to avoid using up their stored stores of glucose. That's it. See you all in class.